Thanks for coming out today. We are uh, all set, I think, to get a new video started. Um, I should be recording. Um, for those of you who are joining us from home or wherever, uh, guess what? Um, the video is not green anymore. Um, why, is, why is the video not green anymore? Um, the only conclusion that I can come to is that my Apple brand display adapter uh, is worth the $29.99 that I paid for it, uh, whereas my $4 Amazon uh, display adapter really likes the color green. So that's how you learn. So anyway, um, we are going to kind of move forward today uh, with looking at P5. And um, today, um, I've alluded a couple of times to the fact that we have a tiny bit of flexibility in the schedule. Um, so today, I'm actually going to spend a little bit more time covering some of the basics that we uh, maybe didn't get to from last week. Um, so nothing has changed. Um, the only thing is that I, I just moved these examples down to Thursday um, because I'm guessing that we probably won't get all the way through them until Thursday. Um, so we're just going to be a, a little bit more luxurious about our sort of exploration of code. Um, and you know, my hopes and dreams for that uh, are that we can just um, you know, spend a little more time on the basics and give uh, people a kind of a firmer f foundation. So. Um, before I kind of take off with my little agenda here, um, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions related to the fact that we only have two weeks left in the semester? Yes. Great question. The final exam goes up on May 11th which means that you have midnight the 10th to midnight the 11th to take it. Um, the format is exactly the same as the midterm, except, <laughs> um, except there are a couple of multi-part questions and some of them are fill in the blank. Um, so, and just so you, uh, I, already know, I know I already announced this, but I wanna make sure everyone knows these, um, PowerPoints that are included in these uh, next couple of weeks, part one, part two, part three, intro to coding, those are fodder for the final exam. Any other, any other questions about that kind of stuff? Any questions about P5? I got a really good question over email. Um, I'm not gonna kind of call anybody out, um, but the question had to do with um, for the uh, assignment, the first assignment, which is the image repetition assignment, um, the question was, can my image uh, actually be looping or can it be changing? Um, and I think the answer is sure. Um, <laughs> we're sort of setting, you know, like a minimum threshold uh, is that it's a static image. Um, but if you, you know, have some sort of code that makes it uh, have some movement, that would be just fine. Um, but it's not required. So, um, so basically, um, you may know, have noticed that we kind of jumped through some of this uh, second part tutorial on Thursday. Specifically, we talked a little bit about variables. Um, we also talked a little bit about basic math. Um, so we did talk about the addition, um, subtraction, and then multiplication. Um, and then, of course, the shortcut sort of formulas for those. Um, so these would be the shortcut formulas. So um, I'm not going to kind of like go over this stuff like, you know, sort of track through it exactly because that's not how we code. Um, so we're really kind of emphasizing the making of uh, the doing of code. Um, so I think that these would be really great resources to sort of like just get the background information um, as you're coding or before you're thinking about coding. So um, Moving into kind of what we're thinking about for today, well, we did go ahead uh, last class and we made this sort of animated um, sketch. Now, there were, are still a couple of things that I want to make sure that you understand before we kind of move on with more, uh, slightly more advanced coding concepts. Um, so at this point, we're sort of dealing with pure default um, in terms of display and visual display. Um, and that might not be something that we really want to deal with. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe look at this background and kind of change around the background. So 
right now, the way that the background is specified, and we can double check this in the reference, um, the background is basically asking for, um, for some value here, um, I'll call it something other than x, just because we have other variables named x in here. So in this case, a, um, for the background, when there's one value, it goes in as a between uh, dark and light. And we can sort of think about dark and light um, or a brightness spectrum in P5 as uh, something that's kind of a holdover from, oh, excuse me. Hello. Um, a holdover from uh, RGB color, which we did sort of talk about for RGB color in the context of using Photoshop, right? So you can see um, through here, um, you can pass the background uh, an actual color, which is a color variable. That's sort of a special color class. Most, um, most of it is this sort of like, this is kind of the realm we're in right now. We're feeding it a gray value. Um, there is also an optional A there. That optional A is for an alpha value. So if you wanted to make the background transparent or you wanted to layer the background over things um, and make it transparent over time to make it look like it's maybe fading, that would be an awesome trick. Um, so you could put any value between 0 and 255 in there, and it would translate as, you know, um, it would translate as a, if it were faded. So let me go ahead and just kind of play around with the background and sort of think about some of the options that we have. So we can certainly give it just a one value, right? And so if I change it to zero, it's gonna be black. On a zero to 255 scale, black is always zero, 255 is white. So we can also put 255 in there. Okay, that's about what we would expect it to do. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this. Now, what would happen if we drew the background after we drew everything else? This is a really common error that I see people come up with, and wait, man, I can't spell for crap today. Um, my fingers are not as responsive as they should be. So let's draw a back black, black background after we draw everything on the screen. And this is going to be super anticlimactic. Um, what has happened? Well, um, literally, like the computer usually does, is it has done exactly what we have told it to do, <laughs> which is we have told it to draw a black background on top of everything else that we drew. Um, and it, it's doing that every single frame. So what does that mean? Well. It may mean that this might not be the greatest place to draw a background, but it also means that it opens you up for cool tricks, like maybe you could give it an op opacity value, um, and you know, then you could see through it, right? Um, or you know, maybe, maybe even that opacity value changes every frame. Um, that's how you can kind of make interesting things happen. Now, what if you get rid of the background entirely? That's another scenario that a lot of people choose to do. So if you get rid of the background entirely, other interesting things can happen. Well, let's wait for it a second. My goodness, that's interesting. Well, what's happening is it's basically retaining every single frame that is drawn. So if I take... Um, the background and take it out completely, it's definitely going to, you know, create this sort of like left behind record of all the graphics that have drawn to the screen since we executed the program. Um, another great way of sort of showing this phenomenon that happens is to, I'm actually just gonna make a free sort of ellipse here and I'm gonna ground the ellipse to the mouse X and mouse Y coordinate. And then I'll hit draw. And so you can see now that um, I probably should comment out this big moving thing. Um, 
but I should be able to get some real estate here. Um, and yeah, so here it's a little bit clearer to see that it's like it's literally leaving behind every single frame that it draws. Um, and so that can be super confusing to people, but it's just one of the sort of essential characteristics of you know, drawing things to the screen. So what's actually happening with the background when you draw a background? Well, literally, the background is filling the frame behind and ahead of, in time, everything else that's drawing to the screen. So, you know, if you have the background here, it's gonna draw before everything else. If you have the background here, down at the bottom, that's pretty unorthodox <laughs> um, in general. Um, not to say that you can't do it, but you know, you're gonna have a very different result. So in general, if you're wanting the background to function like a background, which I can assume that most of you do, um, you can draw it just right here. Now, a couple of other words about backgrounds and color and everything else. Um, as we sort of talked about just a second ago, right now, the way that our color is being specified is in RGB. So if we go back to the reference and look at, um, look at what's going on here, you can see in the parameter sort of guides um, that it's actually not sort of asking us, inherent, it's not inherently asking us for RGB color. Um, so P5 is capable of supporting multiple color spaces. Um, and one of my favorite color spaces to work in is HSB. Um, so if you wanted to sort of change the way that the color works in um, P5, you could use the color mode function. And I'm just gonna show you how to use HSB color because it has some serious benefits over using RGB. Um, it's important to know which method you're, you're in uh, because they're not sort of compatible. Um, if you have numbers that work in one, they won't necessarily work in the other. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, so, so this, is the, um, this is the color mode setting that I went ahead and, and set up. And so what is going on here is I'm shifting into HSB color mode which is uh, also short for hue, saturation, and brightness. And uh, then I'm also using a depth of 100. So what that 100 basically means is that right now, if we were to use the color mode to just describe what we have right at this moment, the default is RGB and 255. Um, why would I want to change my color space from 255 to, to 100? That's a good question. I have a very simple answer. Um, it's because 100 is a nice even number that you can divide into nice and evenly. Um, you know, you can divide it by 10. Uh, it's also just in general kind of like a nicer number to work with than 255. So that's why I generally choose 100. Um, so if I'm working in a for loop or something like that, I can go ahead and take that. Now, nothing looks different until we go ahead and let, let's run it. And things might look a little bit different. This um, HSB color mode, just like two, um, this would be white in RGB. Let me go ahead and specify white here. So that would be white. Um, White in HSB would look a little bit differently. It would be zero hue, uh, zero saturation, and 255 brightness. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there. So let me go ahead and just write that um, into this. So that's zero, zero, 255. And it should give us basically this somewhat similar result. Except uh, I made an extremely critical yet very beginnery mistake, and I would very much like one of you to identify my mistake. Yes. I totally did, yeah. Yeah, so I totally just kind of like undid what I did by putting that second RGB command in there. So if I take that out, 
Um, now it's sort of reading proper uh, HSB color. So this is now just white. Um, and so, you know, that might be great. Um, you may sort of be like just thinking, okay, well, that's nice. How do I sort of like make that work for me? Or how do I sort of encourage, um, you know, applying that color to all of these different um, sort of shapes that I have drawn right now. And so it looks like we've got two sets of shapes right now from our sketch on, fr on Thursday. We've got this sort of static set of four ellipses. We've got the interactive ellipse um, somewhere in the background, which I actually think I'm going to move that to the top. So I'm just going to make sure that it draws after these um, ellipses that are in motion. And so now that's back on the top. And then we've also got these four ellipses that are getting bigger through the Y coordinate. Um, the width, it looks like the uh, this overall scale. Actually, I'm going to update that real quickly. The overall scale and then also the, uh, the Y coordinate is shifting as we kind of add to the direction. So run that one more time, make sure we're in a good spot. OK, so, so basically, I could start sort of cycling through a color if I really wanted to. Let's sort of start with the very basics. So um, probably this stack of ellipses would be a good place to start for thinking about color. So let's go ahead and cut and paste white out of here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just assign a numerical hue. And it's sort of random at this point. So you can see not much has happened, because I also need to put the brightness, um, the saturation up. I'm going to put the saturation up to 255, and that will definitely give me a bright color. So it looks like I'm somewhere on the blue end of the spectrum. And then saturation is at 255, brightness is at 255. Um, for me, sort of like when I play with HSB color, usually the magic sort of um, magic value for me is usually the hue because that actually changes the color. The saturation and the brightness are more, you know, literally like the depth of the color and how bright it is. Um, but if we were to sort of think about maybe looping through this color space, um, probably messing with the hue would be a good place to start. So I'm going to make another variable. And I'm just going to make like a, an H variable. And this is going to be for the hue. And I'm going to start it at 0. And I'm going to put a tiny note for myself that just reminds myself that it's the hue um, in HSB. And so here, I could go ahead and just fill this with H. And it should, yeah, look red, because that's the very beginning of the color spectrum. Now, you may notice a couple of things. Um, it looks like the fill has sort of taken over my sketch, right? Um, it has literally, uh, with fill and with stroke in P5, it's not so much like a command that gets executed just once. It's like almost like it toggles something. So once you start a fill, you have to either bring up the no fill command, or you have to put another fill in to replace it. Um, there's really no way to like turn it off. Um, so that being said, we could certainly add a, a second fill down the line. So I think here I'll try something like, doo -doo. I'll try something like H plus 50. And so again, you can see first fill here, done. Second fill, done. Fills everything else in my, in my world, right? Um, now, how do we get it to not do that? It's totally very simple. You just use the no fill command. So no fill. It's probably not capitalized there. Um, and that basically then kind of, you know, takes the fill away from the entire rest of the sketch. Now, 
it just so happens that the entire rest of the sketch was actually filled with white. So if we wanted the whole rest of the sketch to be filled with white, we could absolutely do that. Um, we would just come over here and instead of no fill, we would give it a, um, let's see, that would be leave a zero. Q zero. Sorry, I'm just, the saturation should also be zero for white. So yeah, so now I have my white fill back. Um, now what, just to kind of like drive the point home, what's gonna happen if I come in now with another ellipse and try to draw it right after my background? It's gonna inherit that white fill even though it's at the very top of the, of the code execution. So fill is sort of like a state that gets enabled and will run until you sort of tell it not to. Um, so in order for me to get this to be um, a fill that on this ellipse that's sort of running around right now, to, for me to get that fill sort of exactly where I want it, I need to actually specify it before um, I draw the shape. So that might look something like that might look something like that. Which in some ways is fast. Let me see. Aha. I still have it drawn down here. There we go. As expected. So um so this is all fine and great. I mean, you can see how it would get pretty tedious um, if you're sort of coding things by hand. Um, and that's cer certainly kind of an option that's open to you for the first assignment, where you could just go through um, shapes and individually give them colors. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a totally legit approach. Um, but I think it would be really fun to kind of maybe play around with like automated ways of assigning color. And that's sort of what this whole HSB thing is like leading up to, right? So, so we have this really nice variable here um, who is sort of, I'm just gonna get rid of some of these fill commands because they're kind of cluttering up my workspace. So let's go ahead and maybe think about some of the other ways that we can deal with this. Um, I'm gonna just get rid of a huge section of code here. Well, I mean huge for, by our standards. Um, and uh, you may be asking yourself like, oh, I just you know, have a chunk of code that maybe I might want later. Um, probably it would be a great idea to think about using a text editor um, and you can just make documents with the stuff stored. Um, don't use Word uh, or any sort of like word processing program. Um, just make sure that you, uh, you know, have a text editor. So if you're on a PC, uh, um, Note Notepad, I think, is the correct um, one that ships with PC these days. Um, and then, of course, on the Mac, uh, you may already have BB Edit uh, left over from the previous, uh, the very first assignment that we did uh, in this class, actually. So, so just having a text editor to kind of store stuff is, is really useful. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that stuff for now and just kind of simplify the sketch a little bit. And um, it looks like right now I have this kind of like nasty red color, um, but that's sort of what zero on the HSB scale looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and just live with it for a couple of minutes um, until we think of something else to do with it. So, yep, so that's where we're at. I have one ellipse that's kind of drawing on the mouse coordinates, and then I have four more that are sort of um, kind of looking uh, for something to do. And so you can see that I've gone ahead and um, drawn the ellipses one by one. Um, we are gonna be working with for loops at some point. I don't really wanna introduce those until next class on Thursday. Um, but let me go ahead and say that we'll work mostly with this ellipse that's kind of moving around the screen for now. So, so what we wanna do 
is I think it would be really cool to take this ellipse that's kind of uh, being controlled by the mouse and get the color to be somehow related or impacted by the, um, by the x coordinate of where we have the object at on the screen. OK? So let's think about the x coordinate for just a second. It just so happens that I have a canvas, a create canvas command, and that that goes from 0, 0 to 600, 600. So we know we have 600 coordinates that are coming through mouse x, or it's just 600 values in general. Um, so one thing we can do is we can take the variable h, which right now, what are the potential, what are the potential values that we could, how many potential values exist in h? It would be how many values of hue are possible. So the answer, yeah. No, it's one, it's 100. So, so the we went ahead and we created the color mode, and by using the color mode, that 100 basically creates the color space. So that's how many colors are possible within the color space. As I said, I did that on purpose because 255 is kind of an, an annoying number, right? Like it doesn't round out to anything. So I just kind of like made that 100 to make everybody's life a little bit easier. Um, so that's 100 possible values for hue, saturation, or brightness. Um, some people call that the color depth. And so in this um, scenario, we really just need H to move up and down, right? So let me go ahead and say something like h equals, and this is wrong, by the way. Um, it's conclusively wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Let's say h equals mouse x, OK? And that'll get us a little bit closer to sort of like the problem that we need to deal with. So OK, hmm. What's going on here? Well, maybe it would be a good idea to print mouse x. That certainly can't hurt. OK. So, so you can sort of see, like, I've got, OK, I'm coming along. I'm moving. I'm moving. Oh, damn, I hit 100. What happens after I hit 100? Nothing, um, because there are no further color items to, to fill. Um, so there are two ways that I could fix this. One would be that if I want it to translate directly from, X, from mouse x to the color, I could actually blow up the color space, which actually would be the easiest way to deal with it. Let's go ahead and do that. If I blow up the color space to 600, I should get a nice full, full thing there. So the hue is changing. It does look like there's something a little bit weird going on with the. So we're getting the color sort of spectrum moving along. Um, it looks like there's just some sort of inherited weirdness um, there. In any case, this is not really the way that I would usually do it, because I have a feeling that um, 600, I think that the color space actually caps out um, at 255. So I'm going to take it back to 100. But that gives you an idea of what it looks like when it's like perfectly lined up um, numerically. Let's go ahead and do it the slightly harder way, which should give us better results. And the slightly harder way uh, to deal with it would be to use the map function. Um, and so what we're doing is we're basically um, using the value of h. So within the map function, 
We want h to equal the results of the map function. And usually with the map function, you give it uh, the variable that you want to change, um, which in this case, we could make that mouse x, because um, that's the number that we're hoping to actually shift. Um, and then you should be able to give it the, the range that you want and then the current range. And I always get this backwards every single time, so let me try it, and then we can do it. Yep, let's see. Ah, so I missed a comma here. That was not great. Okay, so it looks like we're still getting that same sort of color situation that we had before. So probably, um, the other thing, let me get this straightened out here. So I'm pretty sure that I flipped these two numbers. Um, of course, if I were, you know, maybe being a tiny bit more diligent, I could check the reference. Um, that's always a good, good tool. Oh, we might have to. Okay, so let me sort of um, kind of reason through this for a second. Um, I find that that usually helps. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to, okay, we're printing the value of mouse x, and then we're mapping the value, uh, well, this makes no sense. Okay, that was my first, that makes no sense. Uh, try the mouse, blah, 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 mouse x. Okay, let's try it one more time. Okay, so I'm gonna use the reference, which is pretty much like the way that I would deal with it. So um, we already have a variable open, so we don't have to sort of de use this declaration um, that it's using in the, uh, in the thing. But this is really what kind of makes it sort of work, is that start one and stop one and start two and stop two have to be the right things. So we've got value, that's the incoming value to be converted. Um, in this case, I think that that should be mouse x. And then double check, values current range, zero to mouse x. That is not right, um, because mouse x is constantly changing. So the top of mouse x is what, everyone? Like, what's the maximum amount that mouse x could be? Yeah, 600, or if you wanted to be slick about it, you could say width. Um, and then we want to basically take that range of 0 to width, or 0 to 600, and we're going to compress that numerical range to 0 to 100. So this is kind of like magical when it actually happens. And so that basically gives you these sort of like, rainbow fade experience. Um, <laughs> uh, you can patent that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, you can see that basically opening up that range, you know, just gives us sort of the full window to play with. Um, it's a really simple line of code, but it's kind of like a bit of, a bit of a challenge sometimes to kind of wrap your head around. But I would think about it, um, Maybe as if like you were on and looking at, I, and I hate to say this because it reminds me of math class, um, think about a number line. Um, and maybe you had a number line of like 100 numbers. Um, you know, what would you do to get 500 numbers out of that? You would have maybe five entries within each 100 entries, right? So it's sort of that type of a conversion. Um, it's a really, really common conversion um, in digital graphics. Um, and the reason is because you generally want things to kind of like line up with other things. Um, so thinking about color in this way can be really helpful. Um, and just thinking about color in general and how you would work with it in your project. Um, we're gonna use the map function again, for sure, um, because it's pretty critical. 
Um, I do tend to use the map function most frequently when we're talking about stuff like um, when we're talking about stuff like color. Um, and it looks like just now. That's interesting. It looks like I killed my color. How did that happen? Well, let me see if I can fix that. That would be a good sort of fix for everybody. Interesting. Very strange. Let me go ahead and take these out again. So um, I have to say, I'm pretty sure that this is not my problem um, right now. Let me just take a quick look at this. My map function got messed up. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you're right. Good call. Thank you. Just didn't see it. OK, so ha -ha, finally. OK, so that was just a sleight of hand um, and uh, not a great thing when you're coding. Um, one of those um, you know, ways that errors get introduced is obviously like yourself. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I, I guess you could probably you know, think about as far as like, you know, not getting yourself into that kind of a situation is just saving really frequently. Um, and the other thing I do a lot when I'm coding is I actually save iteratively. So like I'll save just like, you know, every like half hour or hour. Um, and give it a different name so that I can go back and recover it. So, okay, so we thought a little bit about color, a little bit about the rainbow fade. Um, we thought a little bit about backgrounds. The one thing that was kind of on my hit list that we didn't really talk about is the idea of a stroke. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring some of these back. So stroke um, in... P5 is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. You can declare in the setup function um, no stroke, and that will turn off the stroke for your entire sketch. Um, one thing that I sort of feel like is that, you know, the stroke is something that can be incredibly beautiful, and it can be something that you can really, like, kind of capitalize on as a design element. But also, just having color next to color can create, you know, new shapes and things that you wouldn't normally see. So I would just, you know, really like whether you choose to have a stroke on something or not is like a huge, actually a huge aesthetic decision. Um, so you can see here, you know, if I let it not have a stroke, things just kind of bleed into each other, um, and then you know I can kind of work on that. Now, if I go ahead and let's say maybe give some of these a stroke, um, I can just you know maybe give them like a white stroke, which now that we're in HSB color, um, I think this should work. It will still process it as grayscale, yeah. So that's fine. Um, in this case, there's a white stroke. Um, what about stroke weight? Ah, yes, stroke weight is a thing. Um, and it can have a really powerful sort of impact on your design. So let me show you how to do stroke weight. So now that changed the stroke weight for everything beneath it. Um, you can actually, uh, you can go really thick with the stroke weight if you want to. Um, we can make it like maybe 50. 
And so that's like, you know, s the stroke weight in this case is so thick, it's like taking the presence almost of a shape, right? Um, so yeah, you can do cool stuff with strokes. Um, and just in general, I think, you know, strokes are um, within the sort of P5 world and in the computer graphics world in general, um, stroke and fill are almost never going to give you performance problems. Um, you know, they're sort of like freebies um, in the graphics world um, because they're such core parts of the language. They're not really like, you know, doing a lot. Um, beyond you know beyond that you don't have to render them or anything like that so it's just another way to sort of like think about how to navigate through some of that form um, I wanted to spend an, a, another just tiny bit of time thinking about you know maybe how to use color in a more un, like kind of unexpected way so we have this color that fades as we move through mouse X right um, what would happen if we wanted to maybe control that with an if statement? So what would that look like? Well, I think these two lines here of code um, are basically kind of, and this also this map function, I probably don't want to like let go of that. Um, these are the three sort of, or four um, lines that are sort of controlling this moving object here. Um, I do think that just for visu visually, I'd like to have them on top of the other stacked objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and move them down to the bottom of the sketch um, so that that way they're on top. Um, I also think that uh, here I'm going to maybe declare no stroke. Um, if I declare no stroke here, uh, will I still have a stroke on the other shapes? Yes, I will. Um, and the reason is because I define the stroke up at the top of the, up here. That's gonna give everything that white stroke, except for this guy. Okay, so I'm in a good place now. I think I can kind of move forward. So probably what we're looking at here is this little H um, as sort of like what's controlling our color. So what would happen if maybe we had an if statement that detected whether we were on one side of the screen or the other side of the screen. Well, first of all, in order to answer that question, we have to sort of think about how to divide the screen in half. Well, so that happens to be pretty easy. That's called width divided by two. And so if width divided by two, um, if mouse x is less than width divided by two, then maybe we will do a thing. And in this case, I think the thing um, is going to be moving this uh, um, saturation uh, a little bit down. And so here, if I go ahead and execute this, a couple of things are gonna happen. I'm gonna get an error message because I have an extra curly brace right here. Thank you, curly brace. Um, okay, so you can see it disappears completely when I hit the middle of the screen. Um, that's exactly what I'm asking it to do. I'm saying, hey, if mouse x is less than width divided by two, make this fill and draw this ellipse. If it's greater than, uh, or basically if this is not equal, then I'm not asking it to do anything. So if I write an else statement here, um, that's sort of a way of like activating whatever would happen if, if not, right? Like if not this, then what? So for my else statement, maybe I could draw it at full saturation when it gets over to that point. A little hard to tell. Um, I'm just gonna comment these out quickly. 
So I'm just basically like testing, you know, whether, it, okay, so that works. It does look like, now that I'm looking at it, that the um, saturation looks like full blast, which is a little strange. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this down um, even more. There we go. So that's much gonna be much more drastic. So now when I bring these up, you can really tell that they're working. <laughs> there we go. Now, notice, by the way, everyone, that the fill seems to have inherited, right? Um, well, I mean, that's kind of what, what we talked about earlier. Um, definitely having that fill inherit. The way to fix that would be to sort of up here make a no fill call. And I'm just going to do that, and that'll be our last thing today. And then next class, we're going to talk all about um, iteration and how to use the rotation matrix. And so now here we go with our no fill on the back. So it's something that you know you kind of have to just get, get used to. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I think that uh, definitely what we're going here for here is like experimentation and exploration and you know, not trying to like reach a level of expertise in, in two weeks. That doesn't sound super realistic. So just enjoy, have fun, and I will see you on Thursday. Hey, let me take my mic off. How are you? Good. <laughs>